Greetings, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this exciting panel discussion on genomic technologies, the next frontier, hosted by the CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, Delhi, India. And this meeting is being conducted as part of the Azadi Ka Mahautsav events that have been running throughout the year. Today, at this panel discussion, we are joined by a very eminent set of panelists. With me today is Dr. Anurag Agarwal, the director of the CSR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology at Delhi, a very eminent physician himself who has been practicing genomics in his laboratory, as well as has been very actively been a proponent of adopting genomic technologies for clinical decision making. Welcome, Dr. Anurag. Uh, also joined today with me is uh, Dr. Geeta Govindarajan, uh, Professor Geeta Govindarajan from the Calicut Medical College in Kerala, who has been pioneering the adoption of genomic technologies for patients suffering from primary immunodeficiency disorders and has made immense contributions in terms of using genomic technologies for, for patient care. Welcome, Professor Govindaraj. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll also be joined by uh, two more eminent panelists, uh, Professor Samir K. Brahmchari, former Director General of the CS CSAR, as well as the founder director of the CSR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, a very eminent personality. He'll be joining us very shortly. And, and we'll also we have with us uh, Dr. Vandana Lal, director, Lal Path Labs, a very large chain of pathology labs that have been adopting and really popularizing genomics in India. With this formal introduction, I would like to invite Dr. Anurag Agarwal to lead the panel discussion on this exciting session on genomic technologies, the next frontier. Dr. Agarwal. Thank you very much, Sridhar. Um, I'll share my slides now. Great, I'll go to full screen. We live in very exciting times. And what I thought I would do today is very briefly go over the current status and future potential of genomic sciences and technologies in health. And of course, by science, we mean knowledge. By technology, we mean application of such knowledge for human aims. And obviously there is no aim of humans without society and considerations of the society. So very briefly, let me start with something that I believe to be very important, which highlights the entire problems and the opportunities ahead of us. This is the most expensive drug in the world. It's called Zolgensma. It's a genetic disease drug, spinal muscular atrophy. It is also a relatively simple in terms of concept, difficult in terms of execution, a drug of oligonucleotides that if injected in time can prevent a child from future paralysis and severe disability. So one of the questions one asks when one looks at drugs like this, one injection early in life and the disease is stopped, no injection, no diagnosis early in life, you can have a lifetime of great difficulties. So what would it take in India for a baby born with this disorder to receive the diagnosis in a timely manner and also receive the treatment, which is difficult as of today. The one thing to realize is that economics drives this world in many ways and health services will drive the future economy. Already you can see if you take only services, not health services, almost everywhere in the world, services are the biggest driver of the economy, no longer agriculture, even in a country like India. Over 10% of the world's GDP within services goes into healthcare. 
far more than agriculture. And this line is true for India as well. <clears throat> Healthcare is in fact now the largest industrial sector worldwide. It's catching up in India. It has the highest rate of growth. Its domestic value may reach about half trillion dollars by 2025. The key drivers, of course, have been an aging population, growing incidence of lifestyle diseases. But <clears throat> we must not forget that technological advancements themselves are a huge driver of the health economy. As we go forward, we will see penetration of health insurance, universal health care, Ayushman Bharat. And all of these will further drive, drive adoption of the latest technologies that may not have been possible today. I don't need to speak to anybody about beyond economic, strategic, societal, and scientific merits <clears throat> of health research and innovation in healthcare systems. That goes without saying that there's a tremendous amount That's of right. societal yeah, benefit. Right. Even if at a scientific level, you were to look at the big trends in biomedicine, I've taken this from a 2019 issue of Nature Medicine. You see six things big biomedicine, read edit tried genome technologies, personalized medicine, regenerative medicines, immunotherapies, and brain-computer interface. Three of them can very clearly be linked to genomics. Let's see how. If you start talking of big biomedicine, you're talking about the confluence of big data, AI, biological research. You're talking about things like the human cell atlas, you're talking about international common diseases, multiple genome initiatives. What you're trying to do is understand health from the bottom up. Basically understand the blueprint and the bricks and use it to model the entire system. And it starts with genes, goes up to expression, goes up to further molecular networks. All of these, of course, will have proteomics and other omics on top of it. But genomics in terms of the genes and their expression and of course, epigenetics now forms a very, very important part of what we do. And very importantly, it is not just about sequencing. As you can see in this slide, it is also very importantly about informatics, the analysis of the data that comes out of genomics and other omics. This is the only way we are going to progress forward. And already, this is one of the most rapidly expanding areas there is. As of now, from arrays to next generation sequencing, everything exists in India. Technically, we are not behind. What we can do more of is, you know, greater emphasis on informatics and putting everything together and building the right medical human cohorts in which this data would make the most sense. The expectation is that next generation sequencing in medicine and public health will soon become routine. What is not yet obvious, of course, is that whether therapeutics will become routine over what frame of time. Already we are seeing that in some diseases like sickle cell disease, where you can correct the hematopoietic stem cells and re-engraft the bone marrow and base, basically get complete correction of the disease. But this will extend further to other genetic diseases as well. We might find that gene therapies may even have applications in people without genetic disease. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. At a hardcore level, it is now possible to create completely synthetic genomes. And these headlines of recent papers show the type of development that is occurring. It is already seen that in pediatric rare disease, rapid whole exome sequencing facilitates better care and ultimately reduces healthcare costs. I already talked to you regarding CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. But do remember these are hematopoietic problems and it's easier to correct them because you correct the bone marrow, these entire things correct. For more solid organs, it's a little bit more difficult, but there's nothing unachievable given the rate technology is expanding. I'm gonna spend a little bit time on this particular example to tell you the directions we are going. I'm sure all of you know the people on the left, Sharpentier and Doudna, who won the Nobel Prize for gene editing. Less people know the person on the right, Helen Hobbs, who discovered a natural mutation in PCSK9 as a beneficial mutation that lowers lipids and reduces cardiovascular risk. Already in monkeys, we have got to the point whereby 
gene therapy targeted to the liver you can get stable reductions in cholesterol and cardiovascular risks for years we are basically coming to a point where not only can genome editing and gene therapies be targeted towards disease causing mutations in genes but can be used to introduce benefit causing mutations in normal genes now this is of course a very slippery slope at what point would you say it is acceptable to create mutations that empower people and make them better than others in a sense of the word and at what point would we agree to introduce such mutations in a heritable way that future generations may become superior now that is a tricky concept which is best left to intersection of science and humanities but is something that you must all think about when you look at the power and the potential but also the challenges of genomics particularly in terms of future equity india has massive advantages in genomics a large population size a very diverse genetic pool yet multiple small endogamous groups to the point that if you look at relatedness of parents how similar are mother and father of a child india has some of the sub populations where the similarity between parents is amongst the highest in the world which means genetic disease must be more common in such communities even without consanguinity so basically the study of genetic diseases the study of treatment of genetic diseases study in fundamental genomics are all expected to become increasingly important in time to come at igib we already have two programs that are on hand in hand on one side we try to discover the genetic mutations in india causing diseases through next generation sequencing on the other side we try to deploy them towards actual tests for actual people using standard cheap pre available systems like pcr and pass them on to partner path labs like lal path labs so that they become available to the population my overall situation assessment is that india already has the basic technologies for most of genomics there is sufficient local demand for these existing technologies there has been a growth of an upper middle class with capacity to pay for higher value but potentially lower uncertainty wellness products we'll come a little bit to that later but we also have now <clears throat> for the first time a national insurance scheme that could be used to scale low cost high value screening and diagnostic measures of high confidence all this comes alongside a global need for new technologies in genomics and genome informatics so those of you who are not technology oriented but rather basic science oriented will find a lot that remains to be done in genomics and there is a clear need within india for gene therapy and genetically engineered cell based therapies that need indigenization this indigenization is critical because many of these technologies are currently extremely high cost and a lot of work research work needs to be done in india to bring it here my colleagues at igib have been working on an indigenous crispr system and we expect that within a few years india will start the first trial in sickle cell disease therapeutics using crispr based therapies so if i were to say what are the key areas in genomics snt that are meritorious of immediate attention i would say development of locally application locally applicable precision wellness services is one of them genomic tests for indians and also to my mind for the many 15 million non resident indians across the world tests that help you screen for inherited disease risks i told you about sub communities with very high degree of relatedness between parents actual diagnostics for genetic disease wellness genomics in which you can give advice to people regarding what drugs what lifestyle would suit them an area i didn't speak much about in today's talk but very very important in genomics microbial metagenomics genomics of the gut bacteria living in your body which outnumber your human cells those bacteria are critical determinants of health and people have shown 
in other studies outside this country that study of the microbiome can help give tailored nutrition advice regarding what may work better for optimal metabolism in people. And I think I've emphasized enough from my very first slide, there's a tremendous need for better genomic therapeutics, gene therapy and genome engineering within India. It is not just about enzymes and CRISPRs and oligonucleotides. It's about an entire ecosystem going all the way to chemistry to deliver these molecules in the right place. So whether it's students of biology or chemistry or even biophysics or people who simply want to model, I think there's a very important role for all of you in the future of genomics in the country. With that, thank you all very much. I look forward to the remaining talks for today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal for the wonderful overview as well as pointers towards future uh, potential areas where genomics is poised to really expand and become relevant to the community. Uh, thank you for sharing your views. We will surely come back to you at the end of the session with more questions from our eager participants. Um, now we go back to uh, Dr. Professor Samir K. Brahmachari. Uh, Professor Brahmachari is a very eminent uh, genomic scientist the founder director of CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, and also the former director general for the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in India. He is probably the pioneer genomic scientist that we have in the country today. And we would be, we are all eagerly looking forward to hearing his views on what genomic technologies uh, hold for us in the coming years. Uh, Professor Samir Kebramchari. Thank you, Vinod and Sridhar, for asking me to participate in this uh, series of uh, outreach programs that you are doing. This is also, I think, a part of the uh, Science Day and the Science Week, the festival that India is celebrating in, seven, in honor of the 75 years of independence. Today, I've been asked to talk about future of genomics. You know, if you want to talk about the future, it's important that you look at the present in the context of the past. So what I will take you back 30 years and say when the genome sequencing was started, the world got divided into two groups. One set of people who believed that genomics will be a panacea, it will change everything, it will solve all the problems and all the diseases. And people like me who believed that genomics will be very important for India 30 years later for preventive health care. And whereas there was a group who felt that this is a pure waste of money uh, doing technological research, it has no biological or functional meaning. No wonder that the in Indian scientific leadership, barring a few, actually fell into the second category. So my being a member of the Human Genome Organization from 1990 and have the privilege of seeing the birth of the genome and in interacting with Charles Cantor and Andrew Mitzabeka from since 85, I was very clear that India will need genomics not only India will need genomics, it will need multiple institutes who will do, and hundreds of scientists and thousands of researchers who actually can make, will make a difference for the people of India 30 years down the road. That was my vision of 90s. 
So that led to my moving to Delhi and establishing Institute of Genomics. So you can see today, the pandemic has demonstrated that how important it was to build the capacity and the infrastructure, not only to do diagnostics, but genomic surveillance. Complete new uh, epidemiology was done in genomic surveillance. And India didn't need technological support from anybody. India could do all by itself. And therefore, if I ask, if somebody asks me today, how do you see genomics in 2030, 2050? And where is the science going? I'd say I divide into two categories. One is where you will have technological developments and application. There'll be, as we you know, that the large number of data got generated from multidimensional omics, from proteomics, from metabolomics, from genomics, genome sequences, variations, then microbiome data, microbiome data. So I think this data management and integration will be one of the biggest technological challenge. Along with layered with uh, personal data exercise, all these digital data that we will generate along with medical records will be the first phase of challenge. And this will need beyond human. It will need artificial intelligence. It will need completely new algorithm. It will need a data structuring, which is not what we can perceive today. I believe that you will create a new data structure by which the expansion of data will not make limitation of creating another new set of data structure. So it's like a watermelon, small watermelon grows and grows and grows. So data structuring will be similar to that pattern that you should be able to grow data continuously without rechanging the data structure. So these are the challenges. The, according to me, functional food will become the most important because we'll know the genomics, we'll know all the metabolomics, we'll know, we'll know which components of it will be responsible for. So therefore, drugs pharmaceutical will start shifting and healthcare will move from curative medicine to preventive and predictive medicine. Now, will it make our life simple? Answer is yes, because for 1.3 billion people, government cannot afford for chronic diseases and various diseases treatment. We spend only about $36 billion, including out-of-pocket expenses in this country, which accounts for about $30 per year per person. It is impossible to provide curative health care. So no wonder the government has taken initiative to wellness. So wellness genomics is the future. You'd like to know why somebody is well when others is not. Why somebody got COVID, why others didn't. Why somebody got multiple time COVID and others didn't. And this sort of uh, knowledge will lead to it. This can only be done if scientists, younger scientists today, build cohorts, build all possible cohorts. And all those cohorts will be the backbone by on which you can then do. And I'm sure, I'm glad that Institute of Genomics has already built several cohorts. Now this will allow us to not only solve rare diseases, identification, discovery, and actual hypnosis. We'll have CRISPR-based technology, cells, it's engineering of cells, which will be able to replace. And it's in, I hope soon there will be a cell therapy engineered cell therapy for Alzheimer's and other diseases. But what would be, that would be a very expensive activity and it will not reach a billion people. It will benefit a million, 10 million, 100 million. So my approach will be that I believe that if you take cohorts and figure it out, why somebody gets uh, Alzheimer's 
whereas dementia, early onset, where the late onset others don't. What is that behavioral pattern that will change? So, which means suddenly we have to go back to the drawing board. That means we have to come back to understanding fundamentals of biology using the knowledge that we have generated. It was simple. You have a one gene knockout, you have a disease onset. Now you have multiple gene, multiple variations, you have a disease onset. A, a compensatory mutation in another chromosome reduces the risk of the disease. So how will we understand these one gene with multiple function? That I think will be the challenge. Genomics today is one gene, one function is reasonably understood, but one gene with multiple function will be the future to understand. And once we understand that, our next step will be, how are the two subunits of protein gets created? And where is the coordination between chromosomes in coordinated gene expression? You know, system is very complex, biological system is very complex. How is this complex system operates? As we, individual variability, connecting to our lifestyle, all this will get then integrated and that's where the future of the genomics will be. Behavioral genetics will be upheaval. There'll be a huge amount of behavioral genetics when we start. Then we start realizing that the way we behave, why somebody is introvert and why somebody is not, why a girl and the flower and music make somebody very happy, others just become indifferent. The problem is, once we identify genetic basis of this and the consequence of epigenetic impact on those, well, our jurisprudential will need a new structure. Then people start arguing that I have this genetic predisposition, so I cannot, I do this because I did this way. So, so I think law has to understand and undergo some changes. The last frontier will be brain mapping. When brain mapping of individuals' variability will lead to their genomic structure, all this put together, will then have a severe consequences of complexity of understanding how we respond to external stimuli. I'm sure corporate world will utilize this to uh, individual focused advertisement. Corporate world will utilize this to see how not only personalized treatment protocol pattern, in addition to there will be complete new way world will look at data. So I will suggest that one of the things that India can do is that a fundamental interaction to understand with diversity that we have, how genomics, how genome sequence actually controls anatomy. Why some people arteries are thin, some are not. And that create even 80% blockage of a 3.2 bigger artery may have a less impact than a thinner artery, which most of the Indians have. So we haven't connected to the anatomy. So genomics and anatomy will be the new frontiers of biology, which eventually bring, I'm sure, uh, such fundamental discoveries that which will be then will be eligible for uh, a Nobel Prize. So in my words, in my belief, India with its genomic diversity in the population, with its capability in a very leadership capability in artificial intelligence, actually we should start creating integrated institutional structure, both virtual and real, where we can bring different expertise to handle this challenge of the future in both understanding fundamentals of biology in application of genomics and take these applications of those knowledge in solving day-to-day -day problem, not only for healthcare, but also in agriculture and other sources. The 
we have moved from genome sequencing to genome writing. And I think the next challenge, already we have written a genome of the messenger and a vaccine. You have seen at what speed the synthetic biology has grown. So genomics of tomorrow will be engineered bacteria to do industrial work. We have to create a sustainable development. We have to make sure we create no, all, all reactions and drug productions takes place in aqueous solvent. Therefore, enzymic, all, all this organic solvent to be replaced, atom optimized, zero atom loss, zero energy wastage, zero usage of non-aqueous solvents, all this can be achieved the way enzyme achieves in our human body. So our understanding of metabolic pathways and cellular pathways will actually help us to design tomorrow's bacteria, which will be the industrial worker. However, there's always a flip side. This flip side is it will also empower people with the wrong motive to utilize this technology and knowledge to design harmful microorganisms. We have seen how a small tiny bug could destroy the entire world's structure, society, behavior last two years during this pandemic. I hope good wishes and good things will prevail over any evil opportunity. The society has to educate people, make them understand, and main challenge of the scientists, of genomic scientists, will be to prepare people for the future, prepare our children to educate them what is good, what is bad, and how genomics can be utilized and they can benefit of. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you some of my views on future of genomics. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brahmachari. Wow, that was a vision worth recording. I'm glad that we have this on recording. And I'm pretty sure it's going to take a quite a daunting efforts to fulfill that vision that you have provided. But fantastic. I'll summarize this once again for those of you who have missed out towards the end of the talk. But this was uh, an apt follow-up to what Dr. Anurag just laid down the groundwork. And then we had Professor Brahmachari who came in and really showed us what genomics is capable of doing. Uh, moving forward, we have with us uh, Dr. Vandana Lal, Director, Dr. Lal Path Labs, Delhi, one of the eminent um, diagnostic labs uh, in India, who has also embarrassed genomics very early on. And um, we are eagerly looking forward to hearing Madam uh, share her vision of genomics. Um, Dr. Vandana Lal, please. everyone. I'm Dr. Vandana Lal, the Executive Director of Dr. Lal Path Labs. I thank Dr. Anurag Agarwal, Dr. Sridhar, and Dr. Vinod Skarya for giving me this opportunity to speak on genomics, the next frontier. What we already know about genomics is its impact of this genomic information and technology has markedly improved the healthcare outcomes, the quality, the safety and has resulted in cost savings. After having understood the individual genetic makeup and variations which inform us about the risk of disease, this has not only encompassed the prenatal and the newborn, but has gone also into the childhood and adult age groups. At the present moment, we are using it as a screening tool to more precisely characterize the health conditions improve the medication selection for patients, and also to design therapies around the disease genomics. This has been a great help, especially in the field of cancer. Now, the current usage of genomics in the field of medicine has been in the field of preconception of prenatal 
as we all know, this is the germline genetic testing for recessive conditions and also the cell-free fetal DNA from maternal plasma or the NIPT test. The newborn screening, it has been mandated in a few states of India, but not all, whereas genetic screening is required for newborns. Now, this is not exactly a genetic test, but if found positivity, then the, it'll generate a need for further genetic evaluation. For disease susceptibility, the germline genetic testing for inherited cancer syndromes has become a reality. For screening and diagnosis, now especially for colorectal cancers, we are doing colonoscopies and it is recommended after a particular age group to routinely do colonoscopies. However, if a stool DNA testing can be used for screening purposes, it will be of great benefit to patients because the invasive procedure will be avoided. For prognosis and therapeutic decisions, there are targeted therapies, which are based on the tumor genomic variations and tumor profiling, which has also been a great help in the field of oncology. Monitoring the disease burden and recurrence, in this, pharmacogenomics has become a big reality because the same medicine will be required in different doses for different patients. So it is standardizing the dose for a particular patient which will be of immense benefit because it will avoid the toxicity of the drug. Now, thanks to genomics, we can look at a disease on a personal level. This personal genome sequence, genome sequences, which can be done at birth, will become an integral part of the patient's electronic health record. And once this is integrated with the clinical and environmental data, this will be useful and beneficial in an individual's entire lifetime. The integration of the individual's genomic information with knowledge databases, which will contain your genotype, phenotype correlations, and also the clinical associations will benefit the individuals. Now, storing and sharing of population data, this is very important. It will, by analyzing large data sets, it will be possible to uncover certain patterns and relationships, which were otherwise not evident to us. Now, enormous value of data sharing will help in the progress in genomic medicine, which has now been recognized and is a, going to be a very, will play a very important role in the future. Now, what are the opportunities and challenges for the future in the field of genomics, especially concerning medicine? This will be building of an infrastructure for databases that will integrate patients' genomic and medical information. This will be highly useful for few clinical and for the future research applications. We must establish both national as well as international knowledge sharing platforms, which will standardize the approach for recording, sharing, and it will have a fully integrated clinical and genomic database. Now, it is very important to develop an SOP for this so that all the laboratories or all the centers all over the world utilize the same technique for recording data. Then it will become much easier for us to integrate this data. Also, the education of the professional, the public is extremely important. We have to engage the clinicians, the health force, and the community in fully realizing what is the medical potential of genomics which we already know is enormous. Continuing with the challenges for the future, this we have also whatever the opportunities are generated by genomic analysis, they have to be implemented. This implementation is very important so that there is a proper healthcare delivery and the population health management can be done at large. A strategic, holistic, and a cooperative intergovernment approach is required so that there is a successful integration of genomic testing into the existing healthcare systems. We cannot have two separate verticals happening, that is genomic testing is recording data elsewhere and the existing healthcare system is behaving in a different fashion. This integration is extremely important for benefit of the patient. Also, there should be, we have to ensure an equity of access for a range of test applications. This will also lead to cost saving, especially if there is a 
we uh, agree to have shared infrastructure and there is a strategic planning around it. Other of challenges which we have to look at in the field of genomics in medicine is the co-occurring variants, the splice site variants, the gene fusions, and also we require to have more trained people who can read the BAM files, that is your binary alignment maps. We do not have enough trained people in India as of now for this purpose. Now, the current position where, as far as medicine is concerned, where genomics is being utilized is to more accurately predict the disease. We are also uh, using to design treatments on the basis of both genetic and non-genetic factors and potentially cure or even eliminate some diseases entirely with gene editing technologies, which has been quite successful in Huntington's Korea. Now, what is the next frontier of genomic technologies? The transcriptome, which is your full range of messenger or RNA expressed by an organism, has been very successful, this technique. But we have to focus on new protocols, which have some of them have already been developed. This will be your chromosome uh, chromatin accessibility. It's very important to understand the chromatin access accessibility because just having a gene, a gene whole exome or whole uh, 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 genome analysis will not may not uncover all diseases the histone modifications have to be looked at protein abundances have to be seen what are the cell lineages happening and we have to go down to the single cell level the genome activity in a single cell is what is the the future entails now next levels will be we all know that these short read technology is extremely popular and we are using these short read technologies at the present moment, and there is not much problem with that. But there are certain issues which are arising due to this short read technology. That is, it can lead to false positive results or even spurious functional associations. In order to avoid that, we have to go into the long read sequencing technologies. These the long reads can span the complex genomic features. It gives you a greater resolution and it gives you a better reconstructed genome. What are the uses of the long reads, especially in the field of medicine? This is being used for the diagnosis of rare hereditary diseases, which have a complex genomic etiology. It will also be useful to identify the, wherever there is a paternal origin of genetic variants. And this is important for uh, risk assessment, for diagnosis and treatment. And one such example is the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, which is quite a common disease in India. Certain cancers will also, which have multiple genomic aberrations, they will be requiring long reads for us to understand them fully and to select a proper treatment for them, these kind of conditions. In diseases like spinocerebellar ataxias and Huntington's disease, we have to read repetitive regions of DNA. This will also be useful if you are using the long reads technology. Structural genomics will become increasingly important, especially where we have must compare multiple genomes rather than you know, stick to the single species genomics. This will help us to get better insights. The studies of genes that are important for develop, development of physiology or studies of evolutionary gen genomics of human disease this will have a complex genetic basis, such as in heart disease and diabetes. And now we know that the burden of non-communicable diseases is rapidly increasing in India. And it is very important for us to understand the complexity of the disease gen evolution, especially in these conditions. And as more diseases evolve, this will help us to understand disease better and design treatment better for these patients. Now, genome biology of cis regulatory elements, which is for your non coding DNAs. In addition to that, non coding RNAs with reference to functional studies or comparative analysis is another field we have to look into. The comprehensive analysis of the dynamics of genomes, the spatial properties of genomes, changes in single cell genomes, and what are the relationships between these is very important for the future. As far as medicine is concerned, 
we have to look at conditions which are associated with aging, genotoxic injuries, and if there is accumulation of mosaic mutations, how does one tackle these conditions? Functional genomics is extremely important. We know that in cancers, we have variants of unknown significance. How they become variants of significance or variants of concern, in vitro studies are required for this because this will benefit the patient for their treatment. Especially in presently, we are reporting a lot of variants of unknown significance in, uh, in various cancers. These patients do not know what, or, or, and their clinicians also do not understand what has to be done. So this is one field of functional genomics, which requires our attention. In concluding, I want to say this is just the beginning in genomics. For genomics to truly revolutionize medicine, it needs to be combined with phenotypic data. Now, what are the roadblocks which we can envisage in this is patient consent, privacy concerns, agreements with companies which, who are contributing to this data, ethical issues, and the speed of data sharing. The speed is the most important thing in data sharing because if we delay, we are also delaying the treatment to the patients. With this, I would like to thank everyone for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lal, for um, sharing your insights on the future of genomics. Yes, we all agree uh, some of the very pertinent points that you mentioned on informatics and the human resource required for um, scaling up to for addressing challenges that India faces. Of course, long read sequencing, structural genomics, non-coding RNA is a frontier that uh, we all hope to conquer in the days ahead. Um, thank you, thank you for sharing. I will surely get back to you with more questions from the audience at the end of this session. Uh, moving on, um, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Professor Gita Govindaraj. Professor Gita Govindaraj is a professor at the Calicut Medical College, has been spearheading uh, the genomics for primary immunodeficiency disorders and one of the early adopters of using genomics for patient care. And um, Dr. Gita Govindaraj, thank you for uh, being one of the early adopters. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, we, would, we, we are eagerly looking forward to hearing your vision for genomics. Over to you, madam. Thank you so much, uh, sir. Uh, respected director, CSIR IGIB, Dr. Anurag Agarwal. Founder Director, Dr. Samir Brahmachari, Senior Principal Scientist, Dr. Sridhar, Director, Lalpath Labs, Dr. Vandana, and Dr. Vinod Skaria, esteemed faculty, students, and friends. Warm greetings from Government Medical College, Kodikod, which is one of the largest referral centers in this part of South India. And we cater to a large number of patients from the six Northern districts, most of whom are struggling not only with disease, but with socioeconomic constraints. Next slide. Calicut or Kori Code, as the district is known as, is renowned for the spice trade, the fine muslin calico cloth from which the name Calicut was derived. We had the landing of Vasco da Gama in 1498 right here. And uh, it was, Calicut was a port of call for the Portuguese, Dutch, Chinese, Arab, and British sailors. And uh, the boat which you see on the right side is known as the Uru, that is still made in Bepor near Calicut. And after the visits by these various uh, nationalities, sailors of these various nationalities, I would say the rest is history and possibly population genomics as well. This is the Atlas of Braun and Hogenberg from the 16th century. It shows a lot of activity happening in the sea, not much in land, just to show that maritime activity was very, very important those days. Next. So we have been practicing pediatrics for uh, more than two decades now. And then there were some perturbing questions that we had. One was, why do some children spend their lives in hospital, receiving one half antibiotic after the other? Why do a few children die from innocuous infections? And why do child deaths recur in certain families and not in others? 
And the most important question, can we make a difference? Look at the pedigree chart on the right. You can see this is a pedigree of uh, one of our children with hyper IgM syndrome. You can see he has lost four maternal uncles and one sibling, male sibling as well. It was an X-linked hyper IgM syndrome. Next slide. So what do we mean by unusual infections? Well, they could be unusually severe, unusually persistent, recalcitrant to treatment, recurring now and again, or they could be atypical in their site or the organism. So if you have unusual infections, the questions we usually ask is, one, is there increased exposure to pathogens as when a child starts going to school? Second, is there an anatomical defect as when you have infections localized to one organ system? Or is the child immunocompromised? If the answer is yes, is it an inherited or primary immune deficiency disorder? So the challenges that we had at the start were that there were absolutely no estimates of primary immune deficiency or inborn errors of immunity as it is now called in this part of the country, a total lack of awareness among healthcare providers, including pediatricians, poor availability of immunological and molecular genetic testing. And we had to cover vast distances to access tests in premier centers. And of course, our naivet, which I would say was an opportunity as well as a challenge. Next. So this was a project that was a collaborative project undertaken by CSIR IGIB and Government Medical College Code. It was titled The Molecular and Genetic Characterization and Genotype Phenotype Correlation of Children with Primary Immune Deficiency Disorders in a Tertiary Care Center in South India. So uh, this was the beginning of a larger program on primary immune deficiency disorders. This was one of our first patients, a seven month old baby boy who had pneumonia, ear infections, diarrhea, persistent fungal infections in the mouth from very early in infancy, was failing to thrive, was pale, febrile and emaciated. And he had pneumonia, he was breathless and had a low absolute lymphocyte count. You can see the pedigree chart on the right. He had already lost one male sibling when we saw him. This was the antibody assay and the lymphocyte subsets. You can see immunoglobulins IgG, M and E were really low. And the lymphocyte subset showed low T cells, CD4 and CD8, and low B cells. So it was a combined immune deficiency. And the NK cells were actually elevated. Next. So this child was in the PICU, had been ventilated once, was treated with broad spectrum antibiotics and a viral infection, which was cytomegalovirus, and is very common with, in children with severe combined immune deficiency. The child required critical care, already said that, and he had been started on multiple monthly infusions of intravenous immunoglobulin and antimicrobial prophylaxis. The diagnosis was confirmed at IGIB by whole exome sequencing. It was indeed severe combined immune deficiency. There was a missense variation, homozygous, in the recombination activating gene, RAG1. And this child underwent a bone marrow transplant at less than a year of age from a matched sibling donor. As you know, severe combined immune deficiency is not compatible with life beyond infancy. He did very well after that and is now off all drugs and off all immunosuppressants after 15 months of transplant. This was really our first success story of a primary immune deficiency disorder who had undergone genome sequencing. So this is, you can see the child looking very sick on the left and at two years, six years, and now at eight years, it was his birthday last week and he had sent us this a very nice photograph. So from uh, the previous story of Asif, 
what we learned was even if you have a primary immune deficiency disorder which is lethal you can save life save the child's life by early diagnosis and intervention the next story was of a boy called haroon the names have been changed uh, to protect their privacy he presented at 1 and 1/2 years of age with the recurrent ear and chest infections and diarrhea so you can see the infections were not localized to any one system he was asymptomatic until 6 months and had been hospitalized more than 10 times due to respiratory infections strangely he presented not alone but along with his male cousin so they were both in the ward together and both had a history of recurrent infections involving various uh, organ systems he belonged to a large extended family he was pale and emaciated his tonsils were not visualized and he had been immunized to age immunological tests were done and we found that he did not have any lymphopenia unlike the previous child his nephelometry showed negligible antibody levels and lymphocyte subset showed virtual absence of b cells so the diagnosis really the clinical diagnosis was an x linked a gamma globulinemia presenting after 6 months because he was protected until then by maternal antibodies next so whole exome sequencing was done at igib but it revealed absolutely nothing so the scientists they decided to go in for whole genome sequencing and they found a large hemizygous deletion encompassing exons 3 to 5 of the btk gene which is mutated in x linked a gamma globulinemia so finally we had confirmed the diagnosis in this child this was a pedigree chart of the extended family there had been five children affected you can see only four which are colored because number 15 uh, of the fourth generation had not undergone sequencing at that time number 16 is the one who was diagnosed earliest he was diagnosed at 5 months of age because we already knew the diagnosis in the family and uh, individual number 18 was diagnosed very late at around 14 years of age and had bronchiectasis and the age of diagnosis and at which we start intravenous immunoglobulin actually determines the prognosis of the child next we went on to do extended family screening for them this is a visit to the house of the child uh, there were five affected individuals in the large family and the gross deletion which was a novel deletion was screened by mlpa 17 individuals underwent screening and seven carriers were detected and genetic counseling was undertaken by our pediatric uh, genetic clinic faculty and they had to do it online because we were already in the pandemic and uh, we had found that 22 male children had actually expired in the family before a diagnosis had been made next slide so uh, from the story we just heard we were able just by identifying the variant in one particular child to scale down from technology intensive whole genome sequencing to cheaper and more easily available mlpa which would really benefit the family the third story i have for you was of a 15 year old boy who presented with recurrent pneumonia ear infections oral ulcers and arthritis so it was not just infections but he also had considerable uh, problems with autoimmunity he was confined to his home on medical advice was never sent to school never went out to play with other children when people visited he was in room confinement not only home confinement he had low immunoglobulin levels except for igm which was elevated and he had normal lymphocyte subsets the pedigree chart on the right shows that um, he had lost a maternal uncle and he had one normal female sibling his mother and sister 
were found to be carriers. Next slide. He was started on regular intravenous immunoglobulin and antibiotic prophylaxis. He became asymptomatic. The family became confident. He started seeing his peers. His mother, who used to go only up to the corner shop on very essential errands, started attending social gatherings. And finally, we transitioned him over to adult care. Exome sequencing at IGIB revealed a hemizygous frame shift deletion in the CD40 ligand gene. So he was having an X-linked hyper IgM syndrome. He's now attending plus two classes online and family screening was done at MRU. And there's an interesting story the mother always likes to tell us. So when the child was around 15, they had a teacher who used to visit. And the child said, well, uh, I would like to have an aquarium. I want to rear fish at home. So the teacher said, that's not a very good idea. Fish should be free to swim in rivers and lakes. The child said, then aren't I also a living creature? Why was I confined to the house all these years? So that was a, a, a very, very uh, sad story that mother used to say. Next. So this is a map uh, showing the various variants and the location from which the patients actually came to us. And uh, what we feel is that we have so much data, sequencing data, genomic reports, but what is lacking is a network of genetic counselors for us to make all this information useful uh, for the family and the community. Next. From primary immune deficiency disorders, we slowly, uh, found that we were transitioning to autoimmune, uh, autoinflammatory disorders, of which HIDS is the prototype. And we have a large cohort of hyper IgD syndrome now. Uh, Dr. Vinod and Dr. Sandhya had already done a lot of work on autoinflammatory syndromes before we started. And what we found was the most common manifestations seen in more than three fourths of our cohort were rash, recurrent diarrhea, lymphadenitis, and hepatosplenomegaly. So gastrointestinal symptoms were very common. And half, more than half of our cohort has arthritis, recurrent AFTE, and recurrent infections. And the least common were recurrent abdominal pain, vomiting, and flares on vaccination. That's a new thing that we were seeing. Next slide. Uh, can we go to the previous slide, please? So we have a poster which was made at uh, IGIB and Calicut together. And it shows uh, just uh, the important signs and symptoms that a pediatrician needs to look for, for suspecting a child to have a hyper IgD syndrome when they're present with the recurrent fever. Uh, this uh, poster was actually shared through the Indian Academy of Pediatrics all over the state. Next slide. So the hyper IgD syndrome, which we had only read in textbooks about, needs to be considered upfront in children with recurrent or periodic fever. And very strangely, it is often associated with the recurrent infections as well. So there's a lot of overlap between the immunodeficiency phenotype and the autoinflammatory phenotype. Onset during infancy is the rule. And although it's difficult to get total IgD levels, elevated IgA is a useful clue. And from our practice, we found that fewer flares were observed on cotrimoxazole prophylaxis. The hotspot variants were identified at IgIB and are now being screened for at the multidisciplinary research unit at Government Medical College, Kolikod. So the team at IGIB had all the data from the patients and they decided uh, that early diagnosis could really turn things around for families and we could not agree more. So a low cost newborn screening assay, a newborn screening tool for T cell receptor accession circles and copper deleting 
uh, recombination excision circles was developed, which enumerates TREX and CREX representing T cell and B cell precursors. It is actually used in several countries of the world, including all states of the US for routine newborn screening. Our institute has one of the largest birth cohorts in the region. And uh, we have just pilot tested this test uh, among critically ill neonates. And we hope that in future, it could possibly be included in the newborn screening, which is already in place for inborn errors of metabolism and congenital hypothyroidism. So early diagnosis leads to reduced mortality and definitely improved outcomes. Offshoot projects that have happened include sanction being accorded for the Nidan Kendra under the DBT UMID initiative and a study on polio and non-polio enterovirus infections, uh, which is being conducted by uh, WHO India and ICMR NIV. So in summary, we have screened around 600 children in hospital who were either admitted in the wards or who had attended our primary immune deficiency clinic, which happens every Monday. 226 patients were evaluated genetically. 115 variants were identified at IGIB. 15 children had the micro deletion suggestive of Dijard syndrome. 11 novel variants were discovered. 17 patients each had been started on regular IVIG prophylaxis and 17 underwent hematopoietic stem cell transplant, most of them at Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. Uh, Dr. Avery Raj was really um, responsible for this. Hotspot variants of the BTK, CD40 ligand, and mevalinate kinase genes are being screened for now. 60 carrier screens have been performed and seven families accessed prenatal diagnosis. It's really uh, wonderful when we are able to offer prenatal diagnosis, which uh, along with CSIR IGIB, we had uh, the CSIR Institute at Hyderabad, which was our CSIR CCMB also helped us a lot. Next slide. So uh, we realized that creating awareness was really the key to moving forward and reducing the burden of disease due to primary immune deficiency disorders. Uh, you can see uh, Professor Dan Kastner, who actually gave us a talk. He's a doyen on, in the field of auto-inflammatory syndromes. And uh, on the right, lower down, you can see a book for families in the local language Malayalam. And another souvenir, which was brought out on an occasion of a CME, Spotlight on Primary Immune Deficiency Disorders for Pediatricians. Next. So what was the impact on patient care and practice? Well, there was, there definitely is enhanced awareness of primary immune deficiency disorders. We are getting earlier referrals. More and more pediatricians are aware. Diagnosis of hitherto unrecognized disorders, especially auto-inflammatory syndromes, is happening. Vastly improved in-house diagnostic capability uh, is now there. We have started doing Sanger sequencing, uh, fluorescent in-situ hybridization, along with uh, the other techniques for immunological assays, including nephilometry and uh, for, um, flow cytometric analysis for the lymphocyte subsets. There is improved clinical diagnostic skills. And believe me, once you see uh, one of these rare diseases, it's really true to form. So when you see a second patient, it presents in an identical um, fashion, and it is not difficult to uh, hazard a guess as to the diagnosis. So we are be becoming slightly better at recognizing patterns. And looking beyond the patient is now a priority. And we not only ask what the questions what and which, but also are getting used to asking questions like how and why. Next slide. Looking ahead, what we hope 
will happen in future includes routine newborn screening for severe primary immune deficiency disorders like skin severe combined immune deficiency and x linked a gamma globulinemia through trek crack screening improved access to curative options including gene therapy because if a child does not have a match sibling donor the cost of a hematopoietic stem cell transplant is astronomical so we hope that things would happen in the field of gene therapy for the better the possibility of rapid next generation sequencing for children in extremis uh, dr anurag agarwal also uh, spoke about this already enhanced availability of genetic counseling services is really key to making a difference and reducing the incidence of these disorders and we hope that one day there would be a center of excellence for pediatric immune disorders in south india next slide so from the team at government medical college kodikode i really like to express uh, my gratitude to csir igib and the guardian consortium uh, dr sridhar shiva subhu dr vinod skaria and dr anurag agarwal we also like to remember abhinav jain who was a research scholar and was working very closely with us the science and engineering research board dhr setting up the multidisciplinary research unit nih mumbai who helps us when we are stuck with immunological tests apollo chennai dr sandhya pulukul from st stevens delhi dr krishna kumar from institute of mental uh, mental health and neurosciences and the foundation for primary immune deficiency disorders and dr sudhir gupta uh, thank you so much uh, for a patient listening thank you dr govindaraj for the very nice real life summary we have heard a lot from the bench in research labs but seeing it actually being implemented in hospitals and clinics is a real delight i'm thank you uh, i'm very thankful to you and calicut medical college for taking the first steps in implementing genomic medicine in real life settings uh, there are a few more questions so please hang around we will i would like to um, have your views on them as well and thank you once again so i want to conclude the fantastic um, session that we had um, with 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 um a quick recap um we had dr anurag agarwal share his vision fantastic vision on p6 medicine and how genome sequencing really um should scale up in a country and and an amalgamation with the 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 low cost diagnostics um for uh, the uh, insurance schemes that government of india is introducing yes we have the safe step set really set in india for um taking genomics forward Uh, but then followed up with dr anurag agarwal's fantastic foundation was dr uh, professor samir k bramchari who just blew us all away with his vision for genomics wow that was a delight to hear him talk about his vision for artificial intelligence new data models of course functional foods we have at least two questions on that for dr agarwal and dr uh, professor samir k bramchari in a short while but of course wellness genomics is a new frontier both dr agarwal and uh, professor bramchari did allude to that uh, we'll want to touch upon that surely um, uh, of course gene editing cell engineering is the next frontier that needs to be uh, really uh, captured from a technology point of view but as dr agarwal mentioned regulations are going to be a very essential component if we need to see genome technologies being implemented in patient care and in the large public health settings and that is something that we lack in our country and uh, we hope to hear your views more on that dr agarwal uh, of course there is there is a you did allude to the brain mapping and 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 i think that's an interesting area where there's a lot of scope for both academia and industry to participate um, and of course the chemistry for therapeutics is an is a nascent area that india has a lot of strengths and our we have witnessed these trends in many um, uh, 
disorders such as developing therapies for um, HIV, hepatitis, and many such um, large scale uh, diseases. And I hope we can do that for also rare diseases uh, in the years to come. Um, then we had Dr. Vandana Lal, who did give us a real uh, overview about what the industry is expecting from us. And it was a delight to hear Dr. Vandana Lal and her, and her vision for genomics. And finally, we had Dr. Geeta Govindaraj, whom you just heard with a real life uh, functional genomics implementation of what I call genomic medicine at clinics impacting real patients. Okay, And that is something that uh, I think if we can uh, repeat this success story in every medical college in India, I think we would have achieved the dreams that Dr. Agarwal and Dr. Uh, Professor Brahmachari just shared with us. Uh, with that, um, I would like to turn over uh, to the question and answer sessions. There's a number of question and answers uh, that our participants have asked. I'll, if, if Dr. Agarwal, if you could unmute yourself, I think the first question is um, towards you. Um, the question is, is there any restrictions or specific conditions for performing whole genome sequencing of a person that is prescribed uh, by medicine as of now? Um, please go ahead. No, I think there are no restrictions upon whole genome sequencing. There are, however, a lot of restrictions on what you can and cannot do with the data. So all data is confidential, as you know, medical data. So as long as there's a medical indication for doing the sequencing, absolutely no problem whatsoever. If you're doing it in research mode, of course, you need to take explicit consent and explain everything before doing it. Even for medical indications, it's always better for people to understand the importance of being sequenced and what it entails. However, the use of any person's private data always requires their consent beyond the immediate medical application. So if one plans to use it for other purposes, that would have uh, governance issues and the Indian Privacy Acts, et cetera, would end up regulating that. But beyond that, no restrictions. Um, I'm going to follow that up last um, phrase that you used because there is a question on it that has come up on um, the Privacy Acts. So uh, with your experience um, of having seen how these um, laws have been implemented around the world, what, what is your vision for how, what sort of laws are best suited and culturally acceptable for an Indian settings? What are your views on that? Yeah, I mean, it's really an area that is still evolving. If you look at general data privacy rights, GDPR, from around the world, there is exceeding shift towards the individual nature of data, complete privacy, and explicit permission for any use or sharing of the data. At the same time, we are seeing a pushback around the world, talking about health as a societal concept and the importance of data solidarity. So the idea is we must think of ways in which a person does not suffer from the ill consequences of their data being used. And what many people are simply moving to are clear declarations enforced by law on people who use their data, giving an assurance the data cannot be used for X, Y, Z purposes, as opposed to not making the data available at all. As you know, in genomic data, complete de-identification is simply impossible. If you had, for example, a known genome and you found another unknown genome with 50% similarity, you would know the relationship between the two. So which basically means given any database of known people, it is possible to make inferences about unknown, otherwise de-identified genomes. So therefore, the idea is entirely to prevent misuse, not by restricting the use and sharing of this data for research, but by making every person who has access to this data clearly understand the liabilities they would get into if they were to misuse the data. That's where I think Sridhar the field is going. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, um, let me welcome once again Professor Samir Brahmchari. He has joined with us. Um, good evening, sir. And um, it was good evening. A, it was a pleasure to hear your vision on genomics, and I, we, I, I'm pretty sure. On behalf of the audience, um, I'm, we are glad that we recorded that vision because we are going to replay that vision in a few years from now. And 
really, really benefit from what um, you have shared with us today. It's really standing on the uh, shoulders of giants and seeing forward. So thank you for sharing that uh, vision with us. Um, we are at the concluding session where we have a few questions for you from the audience. Um, I, I will direct them to you. Um, so this question is asked to both Dr. Agarwal and uh, Professor Brahmachari simultaneously because both of you touched upon this point. So one of the participants asked both, both um, Professor Agarwal and Professor Brahmachari touched upon microbiome and functional foods as key next frontiers in genomics. Uh, could you expand upon how this could benefit for India given our diverse food habits, cultural habits? Um, how do you see this uh, playing out in the days ahead? So both of you can... Thank, thank you, Sridhar, for uh, giving... Um, let me tell you that I am simultaneously in another panel chairing uh, with Jodhpur IIT. So I have put the mute at this moment and get, got into you. Uh, see, I want to tell you... Uh, uh, I just tell one simple experience. I have been determining my blood sugar level and the food, and I'm noting it down for last, all through the pandemic. And I figured out that if I eat idli, which is commonly eaten by South Indians in the breakfast, my blood sugar spikes. So I don't eat idli, I don't eat idli in the morning. So when I told the doctor, he said, yes, I observed this. For many Bengalis, it spikes. So I, this sort of data will come out and you will be able to say, oh, don't eat this food, right? So I have a data of, I think, how many pricks I have given and then I have continuous data. So I will say functional food will be based on the type of food which, which you will eat, by which it will provide supplementary biochemicals and will influence the metabolism of your own process and your gut bacteria eventually leading to uh, healthy living. So functional food is what is a combination of food that is individualizedly prescribed that will make you healthy. And the same food may not be okay for Nurag Agarwal. It may be different. And this is what the future of science, you have to figure it out. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for sharing your experience. Um, Dr. Agarwal, would you like to add something more to it? Uh, just this much that I uh, believe that apart from that, uh, you know, data regarding personal habits and monitoring, we will also be able to infer the causes of such differences, either at the level of the human genome or at the level of the microbiome. There might be other factors as well. But therefore, even in a person who we have not met before, but if we have a sample of theirs and their gut microbiome, we might be able to tell them what is likely to work for them without having met them before. But about yeah, so, Anurag, so we need cohorts. We yes, need so cohorts we need cohort. with all this data. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Uh, the next question is, um, for the again, Dr. Gita and Dr. Um, Anurag Agarwal, both of you touched upon this, so I'm going to let both of you share the answer. Uh, can uh, I ask you one question? Yes, sir. Before please, sir. I have to, if I have any more, no more question, I will go back and because I have to. There's close one more the question, there. sir. I think for you. Let me then. Uh, yeah. Sorry, let, let me finish with Dr. Brahmachari and then I'll uh, come back here. Absolutely. Okay. Um, in terms of. Um, um, uh, yes, in legalizing genomics and genome editing in the uh, germ cell. What are your views, uh, Professor Brahmachari? Um, what are the models that are available around the world for this? Any any comments on this yeah. aspect? Okay, so I was the member of the uh, Human Rights High Commission on this uh, area. This was conceived many, many years back. People thought of it. Uh, I think for only for medical purposes, uh, I'll get back. Can I close that session and come back? Sure, sir. Sure. Please, yeah. please. We will then okay. wait for your answer. Yeah, just wait.
You are muted, sir. You are muted. Professor Brahmachari, you are muted. Can you please unmute yourself? Yes. Yeah. You yes. just go ahead. Hmm. Uh, sorry, I am. I am in another panel. I have to give one answer, so I just take. Okay. We we'll let uh, um, uh, Professor Brahmachari get back from his sure. uh, so, other panel. Mm -hmm. So, the question that I had for um, uh, both of you, Dr. Geeta Govindaraj and Dr. Agarwal, um, is in two parts. Uh, one is, uh, both of you have demonstrated very nicely that genome sequencing does benefit patient care. But what would it take to implement it as a newborn screening for all sick babies in India? One, from a technology point of view, so that is Dr. Agar for Dr. Agarwal to answer. And second, from a very clinical point of view for Dr. Geeta Govindaraj to answer. Please go ahead. We'll start with Dr. Agarwal. Yes. I think from a tech point of view, uh, we are seeing rapid growth in the NGS capacity of India. So that in itself, I do not believe will remain limiting very soon. Even if we were to think of every sick baby with a un not clear diagnosis, failure to thrive being sequenced, I believe that very soon the amount of NOVASIX in the private sector will outstrip the government ones and we will build the sufficient capacity. However, I believe that we will need a lot more data on what is a normal genome within India. Because trying to figure out what piece of which mutation is abnormal cannot occur without enough of a wide spectrum of genome sequencing across the population. And I believe informatics will become the bottleneck. And once we cross sufficient reference data and sufficient capacity to do the informatics well across the country, and also abilities to model some of these mutations that we don't know exactly what they do, uh, either in silico or in model organisms, that will remain a bottleneck. But that I think is from the research side. Yes. Um, Dr. Geeta Govindaraj, your views on what are the challenges for, adopt, um, for really realizing a newborn whole genome sequencing for every sick baby that's born in the country? And uh, expectations so not, not just confined to government, but to many places outside as well. The more people who look at that data, the more chances are. Yes, madam, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the question is not on trek trek uh, screening; it's on whole genome sequencing. Yes. So, so okay. you 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 can give your vision. So, um, yeah. it can go all the way from genomes to a very specific assay. But how do you see it? being implemented in clinics from a clinician perspective? Uh, from the point of view of a clinician, um, this is actually an emergency, I would say, because uh, of course, every individual has the right to the highest possible standard of care and you can't have, um, it's a cheap assay that you have developed, the TREC CREC assay, which is a PCR based assay. And since uh, we are in the pandemic, there's this surfeit of PCR machines everywhere. And I think this is the right time to put in place track -track screening. And then uh, you can find out who needs to have genome sequencing. I would not think of doing universal genome sequencing as uh, Professor uh, Dr. Agarwal uh, rightly pointed out because of various reasons. But uh, I would think that this is definitely the time to put in place the track -track assay and especially in some states where there is data regarding which are the, um, the genomic variants leading to severe combined immune deficiency and X-linked uh, agama globulinemia for various reasons. And especially because this is a disorder with 100% mortality before infancy and very good survival, more than 90% survival if it is detected and hematopoietic stem cell transplant is offered before three months of age. So uh, this is a huge opportunity, which we should not miss. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Uh, we'll go back to uh, Professor Brahmachari. Professor Brahmachari, can you unmute yourself? Um, we'll get back to the original question of- Come back. What are the regulations or models of regulations that you think are best suited for India for implementing genomics? You are asking, Sridhar, are you asking me? Yes, sir. Okay. 
So, uh, getting back to the previous one, it is uh, absolutely uh, clear that you cannot have germ left signs repel modification. Your modification can be on the stem cell and things like that, and you can patch. The reason is we just don't know what are the consequences of those changes. Okay. However, you can do screening. In case you are able to develop diagnostic methods of risk of a baby being born from a disease patient, heterozygous, you would like to prevent, that's acceptable. But to do a manipulation to CRISPR, as of today, you are not allowed to do it beyond five cell division level. Okay, as per, as per international agreed United Nations uh, working groups report, where uh, you can you can access it. It is uh, mm, Justice Carby uh, chaired this, and that paper is there. One can see. Uh, there are there will be a lot of ethical issues of genomic surveillance. You know, you will find certain things that you don't want to know. So your right to know and right to refuse to know is an important component in this process, right? I have my genome data you have given me. I have a right not to know whether I have apolipoprotein E, which variant, so that I'll get Alzheimer or not. And I have a, I have a right to also to know if I want to. So I have both the ways, right to know and right to refuse to know. Uh, is the legal term that is valid. But the problem will come in the legal that as you as give over to the behavioral genomics data comes up. And then you will say, I have a damn it. This all other things come in. That's why no problem, sir. How do I get out of it? I your voice, your voice is still heard, sir. You can go ahead with that. Okay, answer. so <clears throat> the issue is I will... This is where the risk will come. How will you now say that if a person has drug addict, just like some years back, uh, uh, homosexuality was considered illegal. Today we know it's a part of a genetics, right? Genomics, we know. So it's accepted it. Right? The society accepts it. Now, how will you accept that if somebody drug addicts is an addiction, genetic predisposition, or somebody is um, uh, suicidal activity, murdering, the criminalism, and we know there are cryptomaniacs. We know that. Now, if you say genetic basis of a cryptomania, genetic basis of somebody who has homicidal tendency, legal system will get into trouble because you say if you are schizophrenic, you can do a murder and you get out of it. Right? Yeah. So what would be the genetic implication of jurisprudential and legal system is going to be a, a very big challenge and that will need a complete relook at the society. So the science is moving faster than society can accept it. So from DNA fingerprinting, accepting on criminal sites, we have come a long way. So these are the issues that we cover. Can I sign off with this question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your views, sir. I value your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you uh, Professor Bramchari. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Anurag, there's a last question for you. We'll conclude with that question. A very interesting question from one of our audience today. Um, says that quite nice talk and great discussions ongoing, but what are the plans for doing large-scale local ethnic-specific population genome sequencing? Because currently, most of the genome sequencings are compared to the world population or the UK population, leading to a lot of wrong assumptions. So what are your um, views on where, where is the government uh, um, initiatives targeted at sequencing large-scale genomes in our country? And this will be the last question we will take. And uh, Professor Agarwal, yes, please go ahead. I think it's a very important question that we cannot base our inferences entirely on Western data. Now, I would divide this into two layers. One layer are fundamental mutations, for example, in disease like cystic fibrosis, 
monogenic disorders in which you have pretty much non functional proteins i think in those diseases humans are humans and there is a huge amount of similarity in terms of something that creates a catastrophic mutation with a non functional protein in one population also doing the same in another the nuances there may be other mutations that may not exist in that population that may be prevalent in a different population so in many people who have a non functional protein the typical mutation may not be present beyond this when you get get to minor effects which cut across multiple genes as professor ramchari had explained clearly they are very dependent upon lifestyle environment and these combinations could vary greatly for example in diabetes between populations from completely different environments in fact i would argue people who are of the same genetic ancestry but living in different environments also may not be perfect correlates to each other in the end there is only one solution we have to expand the scale of discovery genomics within our country we have to create enough representative sequencing sequencing is not sufficient we have to create cohorts in which the sequencing will be accompanied by collection of lifestyle and outcome data and over time this problem will go away today it is a very very skewed genomics world almost all of it represents one of the least diverse populations in the world africa india southeast asia south asia which contains the majority of this world's genetic diversity probably together represent only about 10% of the global sequence and knowledge and when you say sequencing plus cohorts possibly less than 1% so i'm going to stop there that's what we need to correct thank you thank you for um that fantastic question answer session um in the conclusion um i thank all the panel speakers Uh, Professor Brahmachari, Dr. Vandana Lal, Dr. Anurag Agarwal, Dr. Geeta Govindarajan, and uh, for the sharing your insights on genomic technologies and the next frontier. Uh, I also thank all our participants, online participants who are present on our uh, YouTube channel, um, who fantastically contributed to the questions. And I hope to keep the um, discussions going on on the online uh, forum. Um, and happy to. to answer more questions with that i thank the csir institute of genomics and integrative biology for hosting this fantastic online uh, panel discussion as well as my colleagues dr vinod um, uh, for mo uh, moderating this session um, online and as well as our participants students and co faculties thank you and uh, have a good night all of you thank you thank good night you. everyone bye bye